Hello, I'm Andre J, and welcome to Video Synthesis on the Raspberry Pi, class number two. So in this class, we are going to talk about modulation and video oscillators. So the motivation for this class, the motivation for this session, what we're going to be doing here is... So let's stop and think for a moment. We are working in... Uh, 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 so, so in this Open Frameworks video library, we're able, or Open Frameworks Creative Coding Library, we are able to do stuff like, uh, if you look into like the Open Frameworks reference and look at examples of things people have been doing, you can see there's all kinds of stuff that's sort of like pre-made. There's, there's things where you can just be like, oh, I can just say, OF draw box and do like a bunch of 3D shape things or OF draw 3D primitive, make 3D shapes, have them be sort of like animated moving around, uh, set up cameras and lights and do all this sort of like really sort of like uh, 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 just do like some simple code things and do really complex scenes and complex video stuff. So the sort of question at a certain point is why would I want to learn how to do these things in the shader if I can just, uh, if, I, if I need to use the shader to write like functions and a bunch of code to like do things like draw rectangles and triangles, fill them in with color, uh, 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 why would I be doing that in the shader on like this sort of like a per pixel basis as opposed to just using the tools of Open Frameworks to like do that for me? <clears throat> and from a, one perspective, it makes total sense to be like, no, I'm not going to do this on the shader. And that perspective is all you want to be doing is sort of limited to the, the, the very specific set of like black box functions that Open Frameworks has built for you. On the other hand, if you, uh, uh, if you sort of like take the other approach and say, I want to do things on a per pixel basis, this opens you up. It's, it's a more difficult way to go about things. Uh, but once you get to the point where you know how to do everything geometrically and color-wise on a per-pixel basis, then you're able to do a lot more... You're, you're able to do stuff that would be completely impossible to do otherwise using the sort of built-in geometric uh, uh, shape functions and everything. So the reason that we want to think about making these very simple oscillator systems uh, and learn about modulation and time on like a per pixel, per frame basis is that this gives us the ability to sort of abstract and do just about anything that's possible within the, 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 the uh, pixel raster. And this raster is kind of uh, the most important thing, uh, the most important sort of concept I want to uh, 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 refer you all to. So what a raster means, and you'll hear about rasters in any sort of video environment that you work in. What a raster means is it's just any kind of image format where all of the data is on a per pixel basis. So examples of rasters are cathode ray television. If you are doing things, if you're building, even if you're building pure analog uh, 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 ways to like manipulate video, generate video uh, 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 with uh, CRTs and components and stuff, you're still doing raster manipulation because at the end of the, 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 the chain, you have a raster output. Your cathode ray television is a, a discrete grid. We don't always notice it as a discrete grid because of the nature of phosphors. Uh, they sort of blend into one another. They have this sort of like blooming blend and uh, unless you get really, really close to the screen and zoom in really, really uh, far, uh, uh, we don't notice the discrete qualities of the, 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 the CRT screen. Uh, but the CRT does. <laughs> so if we are going to be doing things, if we want to like make video uh, 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 that is optimized for CRTs or LCDs or projectors, uh, most projectors anyway, uh, then we need to think about how to do things in the raster. Uh, 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 and the other reason to think about doing things uh, rasters, even if we're just using the, the shader like this, is that any sort of, uh, 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 you can abstract these ideas to any sort of medium. So if we're working with rasters, uh, this sort of fragment shader is just like a pure raster sort of like a uh, way of manipulating uh, the, 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 the color data. 
is uh, uh, we can abstract these ideas and do the same thing if we learn and figure out how to do stuff with like analog components or if we want to do stuff in processing or not, and some other kind of programming language. So as far as uh, 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 philosophically speaking, it just makes more sense. Uh, uh, as a side note, uh, raster uh, 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 images uh, are sort of defined in contrast to what's called a vector image. So there is one other way to sort of represent uh, uh, image data, and that's in this sort of relative vector term. Uh, and if we think about uh, uh, the history of displays, we can see that it's, uh, uh, if you contrast a cathode ray television screen, which is always scanning, it's always moving, it's always drawing like a grid, even if you have a video single, which is completely black, it looks like nothing's being drawn, but the video, the CRT, is still constantly spraying out uh, uh, electrons, just spraying out very weak electrons. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, raster is a traditional CRT, uh, but anyone who's ever worked with oscilloscope graphics doing like XY stuff, uh, what is sometimes called like the, the, the vector display mode, uh, you realize that that's actually representing things in a different way because the beam actually only draws uh, uh, when you have specified some sort of information. So the, the original vector displays were oscilloscopes, which were in contrast to a cathode ray television. So both the same sort of like technology, but different protocols for how the beam draws things. And in modern day uh, parlance, vector graphics are uh, uh, what you use for like something like Adobe Illustrator or different kinds of like designs where you need to have graphics that scale to any sort of up or down, uh, 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 upscaling or downscaling and not sort of like end up with pixelated mess. And these vector graphics are ones where you just sort of like, you're talking about relative positions of uh, points and then connecting the points with different sorts of lines, straight lines, beziers, splines, what have you. <clears throat> so that's raster versus vector. We're not going to talk about vectors here anymore. I just wanted to tell you about that in order to explain why we care about any of this. But yeah, on to the class. All right. So uh, another note is that at the beginning of each one of the classes, I'll pretty much be starting off from the same project that I sent you at the end of the last class. So more or less, whatever you do on your own for your homework, uh, 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 what I'm going to do is sort of bypass that and make sure that we all sort of start from more or less the same template that we ended off at the last time, uh, 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 just, in, just for the sake of making things sort of like smooth and flowing for, for uh, uh, my end. Uh, so let me show you. We're going to start off here and talk a little bit about gradients and movement across the screen. Uh, so this is sort of the, the one of the main things I wanted you all to learn about geometry last time while sort of exploring the color space was to think about how to move these color bars across the screen in directional manner. Um, so what I've done, I've, I've sort of added this in here, is I added another variable called grayscale value. And the grayscale value is fract. I hope everyone learned about fract last time uh, during the homework. And fract, what it does, if you didn't learn it, is something that if you have a value that goes above one, and in the shader, like I said, most all the values we're working with are normalized from zero to one. So fract is sort of saying, as soon as you get above one, and you've got something like 1.1, let's chop off the, 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 the first one and just re, just make sure we have the decimal point. Uh, so if we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, we're going up, and then we get to 1, and it starts over at 0. And then 1.2 gets mapped to 0.2, 1.5 gets mapped to 0.5. So what we're doing is fract is a really simple way to sort of keep all of your values when you have values that are going up or go, uh, uh, keep going up, we'll keep them in the ranges that we care about because our, our spatial, our geometric and our color ranges are all normalized to zero and one. So you give something a value of two and it's like, I don't care about that. Uh, but yeah, so we're taking this grayscale value, we're saying 
uh, uh, take the, the value of color X, and that's our position in the X axis. Uh, we're gonna add this Nano 1, which is a continuous controller coming from the Nano controller. Uh, uh, and what I'm going to do is we'll add this offset on from the continuous controller, and then if we go above 1, we'll just chop that off. So, pretty simple. Um, and then, because this is we're just working in grayscale, I feed R, G, and B all with the same number here. And we'll just take a look and see what this compiles to. So, I just type make run. Um, so this is sort of a, a very simplified version of a lot of the stuff you were doing in the homework. And if you were having trouble with the homework and you jumped onto the class anyway, this should kind of like give you a little bit of a help moving forward. Um, so you can see that if we start off right here, this is what you would expect to see. This is a, a, a zero being added to the, 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 the color X. And then if I move it over, we can see we're getting like a cycling happening. It just starts over from zero and I've got the, the knob turned all the way up to one. So the values are all between uh, one and two, but we're throwing away everything that's not a decimal. Uh, everything that's in, in to the left of the decimal place and we're just working with the values from 0 to 1 again and I do this negative and we're seeing I subtract 1 and it still does the same thing so it works with negative values too up to a certain point there's probably some glitchiness in there somewhere uh, 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 but for our purposes right now it seems to be working pretty well so we're able to sort of physically move this in a direction uh, but the interesting thing about working with video synthesis, video oscillators, is that these should be free running. We should be able to sort of control the rate of how they run, uh, but we want to be able to sort of like have these things free running on their own so that there's just some sort of constant movement, movement happening. So the way to do that, let's just think for a moment. If we're working within the shader here, you can see the thing to remember about the shader is that shaders, this fragment shader, doesn't know anything on its own. It knows zero about anything else that's happening other than the XY coordinate of each pixel it's drawing at every single cycle. So in order to get some sort of time information into here, we're going to have to step outside of the shader. And this is something we want to handle over in OFApp.cpp. So in order to set up time, I am going to uh, set up a variable here and we'll just say um, float time one and we'll make sure to set it to zero to start. Float time one, that's our that's gonna be our time variable, and so that's how things will change over time. And then if I go down here to this draw and draw cycles 30 times a second. So if I say time plus equals 0 0.01, we've got, we'll have this sort of incrementing at every sort of stage of the draw. So it'll just keep going up. And then what we want to do is send this over as a uniform float to the shader. So if I just, fun fact, most people who write code copy and paste things all the time because otherwise it's pretty easy to make like a lot of errors especially if you're like me and you're sloppy and you're bad at spelling so send time one did I say time one or did I say time <laughs> here's the other thing is time one because we might want to have multiple times working with here so easy easy to uh, just sort of assume you're probably going to be making multiple versions of a variable if you name it something like blatant like time and we'll send time one over uh, we want to make sure we go up in here and have another uniform float time one and then we can set this up to sort of move things around so nano one uh, let's just replace that with time one for now just to make sure everything's working well and then make and make run because I changed the C++ and I changed the shader stuff so we'll set this up to run so 
this should give us a free running, a very basic oscillator. The thing about what the wave shape of this oscillator is, uh, 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 we have it starting from zero and then going up, going up, going up, and then as soon as we get to a certain point, we stop and we start over from zero. And this is basically, this is the, 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 the most basic wave shape we have in signal processing is the, 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 the sawtooth or ramp wave. Uh, 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 technically speaking, a sawtooth wave, well, we need to like have some sort of explicit in, like direction in order to think about saws and ramps. Uh, 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 we're sort of arbitrarily saying like, uh, we move to the right, that's up, move to the left, that's down. Um, so we can say it because it's going from zero to one uh, in our sort of imaginary, like, uh, arbitrary decision of what space is. <laughs> that would be a ramp wave because it goes from zero to one. A saw wave would go from one to zero. Uh, I'm sure different disciplines and different applications will have very different ways of defining those two things. Uh, but really, a sawtooth wave and a ramp wave are the same thing. It just depends on whether it's something you could ride your BMX bike up and then catch some sweet air, or if you're using something to slice uh, wood. <laughs> okay, so we have the very basic, simple oscillator system here. Uh, it's not even a system, it's just an oscillator. Uh, uh, but we want to think for a second. So we've got this sort of movement and it's moving, it's changing things and it's updating things every single frame. So let's think for a moment about frame rate versus video rate. Uh, 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 when I think about frame rate, we have something that changes if, if the, the, the incrementer is changing only based on what's happening in the C++ side of things, this is a frame based modulation. And if we think about it, we can't have anything that goes that is going faster than uh, a one thirtieth of a second. Otherwise, we will have aliasing. Um, we can try to actually let me set something up here, and we can sort of look at uh, uh, what happens. Uh, well, so we'll set up controls later and talk about aliasing and stuff like later on in the in the, the class. Uh, but ultimately, if we have something that moves faster than like one thirtieth of a second. Uh, we're going to sort of lose some data and what gets sent to this shader because the shader is only sampling getting information from the 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 c plus plus one thirtieth of a second if we have something changing too much during that period where it's only going to be sampling and it's going to be sort of like making the wave shape whatever uh, movement uh, uh, seem like it's f like going slower than with the uh, information we're sending so if we want to have more, but we only have modulation sort of happening on like a frame basis here. Uh, 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 so if we want to get more complex modulation happening, something which is changing within every single frame, we want to sort of uh, uh, work out how to have another sort of modulation happening within the shader. So, so we have to remember, what does the shader know? The shader only knows geometry position of where it's at. So we need to figure out some way to send a control into the shader that uh, uses the geometry to sort of make more cycles happen within the shader itself. So the, the, the main way we've been using to uh, modulate just the, the, the gradients within the color is this color X, which is based on text chord varying X. So what we want to do is send another control in. So I'll send another nano controller control in. And what we'll do is set up a nano two here. We'll set it control one one, nano two. Make sure to go over to the shader and make sure everything is spelled correct and ah. Always easy to make sure things are spelled correct by just copy and pasting and changing numbers. <laughs> so if we scale this color X with another variable we call nano2, and let's do something so let's, we want to sort of keep it as the same value as default. Uh, and as nano 2 goes up to 1 and 2, we're going to scale things that way. So we'll set up 
We'll multiply it by 1.0 times, and let's make this value pretty large, just for the sake of uh, 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 being able to really see what the difference is as we go up. So we'll say 1.0 plus 20 times uh, nano 2. All right, so now we click make and make run. So let's all think about what we're going to be seeing when we uh, turn it on and start moving things around on our controller. So the default, the thing we saw before, was just sort of a gradient, which was the exact width of the screen, and it would just move free floating uh, 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 in one direction. Uh, and we want to add some sort of more modulation within the screen itself. So what we're going to do is just sort of multiply the scaling gradient by a, a larger or smaller number. So what we should see is sort of tiny little squeezed in uh, modulations of the gradient based on uh, uh, horizontal position. And there we go. So we've got more frequencies happening per screen. So what we're doing is modulating time. So with every sort of time step, we're moving one direction in, in this way. And then within that sort of time step, we've got another set of modulations happening, and that's per uh, geometry. So uh, what I like to do to call these two different sort of modulations that we have in video, so let's take a step back and think about how do we describe modulation within like a one-dimensional signal, which is the, the traditional sort of audio signal? We think about a wave that has a, 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 a frequency, which is sort of how many times does it go up and down per a specified amount of time, and we talk about uh, amplitude. Uh, so we can think about frequency and amplitude in a video oscillator as well, but we have to have one more component because we're thinking about this is a two-dimensional oscillator. This oscillator is not just one-dimensional, it has two dimensions because we have to just not change over time, but we have to change over this sort of frame that we're working in. So the way I have usually used this and uh, uh, is to think about rate, Rate is how we change from screen to screen, and that was the time one that we used. Time one is the rate of our oscillator modulation. Uh, uh, the frequency of our oscillator modulation is this, and let me show you quite explicitly here. Frequency is this color X times the nano control thing. So this is how many times does it change per frame. And then our amplitude, we're setting this off as sort of like a default from going from 0 to 1 uh, um, in sort of brightness. But we want to think about amplitude uh, uh, as mapping into brightness in this space. So if we wanted to have a very sort of like muted oscillator, we can set up another little control to uh, change the amplitude. So this is sort of where I'd like you to pause the video. And following the examples I've set, I want you to figure out how to add controls for amplitude, frequency, and brightness for this oscillator. And when we come back together, we'll turn this into a little function in the shader and think about more complex things we can do with uh, 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 oscillators in the shader. All right, so pause and hop back here in a second. All right, so we're back. And I hope everybody had a, a, a success with creating the controls for their oscillators. So I'm going to show you how I set up controls for mine. And I'm also going to show you what I meant earlier about aliasing. So if I want to have a control that controls the rate, meaning the changes per frame, all per frame stuff is best handled over in the CPP. I mean, it's not just for best handled. Sometimes it's the only way to handle it. Uh, 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 in this case, it's the only way to handle it. We could figure out some sort of hacky ways to like do per frame operations in the shader, but it's absolutely pointless to do so. This is just going to make the shaders compile worse. Uh, 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 remember that the shader compiles for every single pixel, and if we're working in an SD resolution, which is 640 by 480, we're working with about 300,000 pixels, meaning that everything that happens in this, when this executes once, this executes simultaneously about 300,000 times. So anything that we can 
have run only once as opposed to running 300,000 times, we should definitely try to do. <laughs> Computers are fast, but they are not infinitely fast. And once you start working with video stuff like this, you find yourself coming up against what are the limits of uh, both serial and parallel, parallel processing techniques pretty quickly. Uh, but yeah, so over in the CPP, I set up control one zero uh, 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 to be the sort of time incrementer. And because I didn't really add any sort of way to scale this down, we would really, and we're going to find out that we definitely want to scale this way farther down. Uh, uh, this is going to be incrementing very quickly, and we'll see some aliasing in time pretty quick. Uh, over in the shader, I set up this Nano 3, 1.0 minus Nano 3 as our amplitude control. Uh, I set it up this way very specifically because I want it to default. If Nano 3 is 0, I want the amplitude to be all the way up at 1. So we don't have to immediately move a knob in order to see that our, our uh, uh, in order to alter the amplitude. Because we want amplitude to be at full if it's video. We don't want to have to physically turn it up every single time that we start our sketch. Um, so this is amplitude and we're just multiplying this by the fract statement here. So amplitude is just uh, handled by scaling the output of this fracting over here. And this fracting is our sawtooth wave, uh, how we calculate sort of the frequency and rate of it. So uh, in order to see aliasing in the frequency as well, I changed the value that we're scaling nano 2 by up to 200. So we'll see some aliasing in that space as well. And we kept time 1 over there. So let's take a look and see how this works. And I can show you what I meant by aliasing when things get sampled and the, the speed looks wrong or the frequency looks wrong. The rate looks wrong or the frequency looks wrong. Okay, so we start off like that. And you can see as I move the rate control, we can move it in either direction. So I set the rate, all of the default controls on the nano control that I set up for y'all's in here are for bipolar controls, meaning at the middle it's zero, uh, and then you move it one direction and it'll go from zero to plus one, and you go in the other direction and it goes from zero to negative one. So there's a certain point where you can see I'm increasing, so let me start from zero, pretty close to zero. That's pretty close to zero, and let's increase the rate. So as I move this to the right, we see it definitely seems to be speeding up, and then there's a certain point where the apparent movement seems to kind of like go back and forth from like right to left, left to right. It's kind of hard to tell which direction we're moving in right now. And this is when the aliasing starts. And then at a certain point, the aliasing is going to sort of like beat uh, with the sample rate of the, the, the shader, which is uh, 30 hertz, 30 times per second. And then if I turn it up all the way, it's actually, it's aliasing so perfectly that we seem to see no movement whatsoever. So that's how fast, and not just how fast it's moving, but the fact that it's moving so fast and getting sampled at just the right way that it seems like we have zero apparent movement. And then as I turn it down, it seems to speed up again. Uh, and then we bring it back down to zero. And the same thing happens if I move it to the left direction all the way to the, 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 the top makes it seem like there's zero movement even though it is incrementing every time we go around. So let's keep this at a small value because next we're going to talk about aliasing in the, the, the frequency domain. So you can see one thing right off the bat is if we have this frequency number too high we don't really get a, a smooth movement between the values. Uh, uh, the, 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 it ends up stepping. Uh, 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 this is sort of a common thing that people have a problem with when you have some sort of analog control that's controlling like a digital signal is if you don't have things sort of set to the right kind of like uh, scaling, you're going to get stepping, meaning that like you're moving a control analogly, uh, but it sort of does a discrete step in the controls as you go out. I actually really like this a lot in like I, I used to have a lot of like 80s style digital analog hybrid synths and the filters on those would always be kind of steppy uh, and I actually really like that sound personally.
and I found myself once I started getting better synthesizers, I would try to figure out ways to program them so that the filters would do like that sort of stepping thing. Because I really like the sort of like ding 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 kind of thing. But as we increase it, we're getting to a certain point here. We're starting to see some aliasing already because the the the, the movement of the uh, things seems to be sort of different at the top and the bottom of the the, the screen. And as we go up to a certain amount, we've just kind of got some noise happening here. We have some aliasing in the frequency domain because we're seeing this sort of banding. And the banding is just sort of uh, 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 happening because of how the pixels are being calculated and how it sort of interacts with the, 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 the actual amount of pixels that we can draw on our screen. So this is aliasing in the frequency world. Something else you might notice is there's this weird horizontal line that like uh, is going right down the middle. Um, well, we might see this uh, when we start to play with feedback too. Uh, what this is is uh, it's an artifact of the fact that whenever we have like a rectangle, that's our canvas. Uh, uh, the, the 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 way that shaders actually compute uh, shapes, like any kind of a shape, from even just a straight up rectangle canvas to like a really complicated 3D object is in these sort of triangles. It chops things up into triangles and then it computes everything for each triangle one at a time. So if we have a rectangle, uh, it's actually composed out of two triangles with a di diagonal line down the middle. And if you do some things that are kind of out of bounds, uh, then you're going to see some aliasing happening because of how different things get how things get calculated differently on a per triangle basis. So yeah. That is the basics of how we do a uh, uh, rate, frequency, and amplitude controls for our oscillator. And next, we will turn this into a function and think about how to make other wave shapes. All right, so let's next work out how to make our oscillator into a function. So a little uh, a comment here is that <coughs> Something I've noticed a lot from teaching this class and teaching coding classes in general, teaching coding to people, is that a lot of people who have a lot of experience uh, working coding in a professional environment have this tendency I've seen to really sort of like uh, 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 put a lot of overhead into functions and procedures. Uh, 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 there, there's a tendency to make them really large and bulky and throw a lot of special cases into them. Uh, 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 and this is sort of the main reason I try to avoid using functions in general uh, 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 in all of my programming things is because there's this tendency to sort of make a lot of special cases, make them really large and bulky, have like way too many arguments in them. Uh, 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 and I'm still kind of like working out the, the best way to sort of split these things up in my own uh, practice. So I don't really have like a real like firm and hard line of like when do you turn something into a function, when do you not? Uh, 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 but I do want to show you how to make a function, so that is out of that. That is like not up for question here, and I do sort of want to uh, stress that we want to make sure we drill things down. We're only making a function if it's something that we're definitely going to want to reuse over and over again and make the code simpler. Basically, if the function, if writing a code is just sort of hiding complicated things somewhere and putting controls into a black box where you can't do anything with it, then it's sort of a bad idea. If writing a function gets too huge, you have like tons of special cases, tons of switches and if statements in there, uh, it's not a good idea. On the other hand, if you're dealing with something where you just want to smooth things out and like you actually are sort of like uh, saving time instead of just like making a black box and like, uh, increasing possible confusion in the future, then it's time to think about can I split this up? Can I modularize this? If I'm going to write functions instead of writing one large one, can I write four small ones that get reused in a more efficient manner? Uh, so that's just something to think about. But let's talk about the grammar first. So we can see there's a couple of example functions we have to use here. So we want to start off by declaring what is our output going to be. So our output for this function is going to be a floating point number. So float oscillator. Uh, and then we have, we're going to have our arguments in here. And we're going to do some uh, uh, operations on the arguments and return something. So the arguments we want for our oscillator, we want to have in, float, amplitude, 
we want in float rate and in float frequency and we also want to have the ability to change between different wave shapes so let's say in uh, uh, int so we just want this to be a discrete number an integer uh, wave shape so just for the sake of whenever I test things out, I want to am replacing a, a, a line of code I wrote with a function. My thing to do is keep it really simple and just make sure we just do exactly what we were doing in the line of code and uh, double check that everything runs exactly as expected with the um, uh, function version of it. So we're going to ignore wave shape for the moment because we haven't set up any kind of a wave shape test in here. Uh, we're going to copy this code over here. Uh, first, I want to define, let's define a little dummy variable. So we'll just say float osc. And that's the dummy variable we'll use. And we'll set it off to zero at the, the beginning. And we'll make sure that we have a line down here that says return osc. So whatever we do to osc in the meanwhile, this will be what gets spit out at the end of it. So we can say here, our default wave shape will be a, a, a sawtooth for now. So osc equals 1.0 minus nano 3. So of course, we want to pretend that we don't have access to anything. For the best way to write functions too is uh, if you understand the difference between procedural and functional programming, uh, I like to th really drill down on the difference between that just at least once, is that a procedure uh, 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 technically speaking is one where you can access data that is outside of the scope of the function. So if we left it just as this, uh, this would be a procedure because it's accessing nano 3, color x, nano 2, and time 1. All of these things are defined outside of the scope of the function. Uh, uh, but if we want to write a true function in the, 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 the true sense of the word, we want to make sure we're only accessing things that the function knows about. So that means we have to replace nano3 with amp. We have to replace this color x uh, uh, times the nano2 with frequency. And we want to replace this time1 with rate. So, and we'll ignore wave shape for the moment and come back to that in a second. But then we go in here and we say our, this was our line for grayscale, grayscale value either. Now let's just, without even like commenting it out, let's say grayscale value. Now let's just overwrite the value of what's going in there is oscillator. And remember our arguments are amp. What we had for amp is this right here, 1.0 minus nano 3. So that's our first argument, amplitude. Uh, our second argument was frequency, and that's color x times this thing. So we'll put that in as our second argument. Our third argument is time 1. And then our fourth argument, the wave shape, we don't have anything set up for that. So we'll just set that as zero as a default value. So what we're doing here is we've sort of kept this right over here. And then we're just going to overwrite that value with what we do with the oscillator. And we just want to make sure that this looks the same as everything else. Uh, something else we want to do is stop the aliasing. So I'm going to change that value right there. And I'm going to go in here and make sure to scale this by 0 0.01 times that. So then we'll have a much slower, uh, uh, wider range for control of rate and frequency. We won't have aliasing. And we'll also hopefully have bypassed the worst of the kind of stepping that we were seeing. So we shouldn't see too much, if any, digital stepping in our uh, uh, output video here. Um, so let's think about, while this compiles, let's think about what we can do now that we have this oscillator function. Two main things, and these will be what most of the homework will be about, is going to be about how do we sort of modulate oscillators with other oscillators. Because, of course, the first thing that you think about is that once you have this happening is that uh, 
it's actually not really that interesting just to have these sort of like uh, uh, sawtooth patterns moving from one side of the screen to the other. That's not really like, if you think about all the sort of shapes and movements, ooh, we have a bug. Let's do some uh, uh, bug testing here. Awesome, a bug in the wild. So line 15, type mismatch in expression. So let's look up and see what's happening in line 15. Oh, that's the OF app. <laughs> line 15 is almost certainly in. So float osc type mismatch. Of course, this thing haunts me to this day, as you can see, is that uh, 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 in the shader, you can't really set a float equal to an integer like that. You have to make sure to add a decimal point in. Um, otherwise, you get bugs. Uh, but yeah, so it's not really that interesting to have just the sort of static kind of like wave shape repeating over time. Uh, 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 but the thing to think about is that once you have this oscillator function, it's going to be pretty easy for us. So... Here we go. We've got amplitude. Something I kind of goofed up in there is the default value of amplitude. We're able to change the rate. Rate is moving pretty slow, so maybe we want to speed that up by like 0.2 or 0.5 instead of 0.0 or 0 0.01, 0 0.025 or 0.05. And we're getting a tiny bit of stepping, but it's not uh, obnoxious. But yeah, we've got basically the same behavior happening. Let me just double check. Let's double check and see what is going on in here. Ah, yes. We want to just have this be amp times that and not 1.0 minus amp. Otherwise, we're reversing things around. <laughs> and this one, we want to speed it up. So let's say 0.5. A nice rule of thumb, too, is that I, I, I have this tendency to do th this as well, but all of us working in the metric system have an issue where we think point, point 0.1, 10, 100, using like these sort of default scaling things of moving up orders of magnitude of powers of 10 is like how we like to do things. Uh, uh, when you use powers of 10 in the, 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 the digital realm, uh, or more specifically the binary digital realm, which is how computers work, uh, 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 we run into the problem very occasionally, not super often here, but in other programming languages, you'll notice it more, is that uh, uh, decimal values of powers of 10, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, are uh, 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 irrational numbers. Uh, 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 and you want to try to use actually decimal values, which are powers of 2. So that would be 0 0.5, 0 0.125, so on and so on. Uh, 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 <clears throat> yeah, not really going to fuck up your life too much in this class. Just a good thing to think about. All right. <laughs> So we've got our oscillator function set up. So now it's time to start playing with multiple oscillators uh, 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 and using them and combining them in various ways. So the first thing that we want to do here is let's rewrite a couple of things in the code here. Well, actually, first before that, I set up some controls uh, uh, in order to like have multiple controls for two oscillators. So we just sort of duplicated everything. We've got time one, time two. Uh, uh, and then nano one, two, three, nano th four, five, six. So just different controls for each oscillator. So then we can actually sort of see what's going on when we combine the two oscillators together. Uh, before we go to combining them, I also want to show y'all um, how we're going to do things to use other sort of geometric axes, to use the, the y-axis in order to, to drive a vertical oscillator too. This should be fairly obvious based on the, the homework from the last time, but of course we just use, instead of using color x as our frequency component, we use color y as our frequency component. So we just align the gradient along the y-axis, and just to show you what that looks like, uh, what you should see if you're doing the same thing as me, let's run this and just play around with the vertical oscillator for a second. So 
we're wrapping up here. Uh, I'm going to show you one more thing we can do using these multiple oscillators together. And then the homework for this is going to be primarily about how do we combine oscillators together? Uh, how do we make more complex patterns out of this stuff that we've got? So you can see I'm able to control all of the same components uh, uh, that I was before. So part of the homework will be adding and subtracting, figuring out different ways to sort of mix these together. Uh, and part of the homework will be doing some sort of modulation, using oscillators to modulate other oscillators. And the most, I think the, 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 the easiest one I can think of to play with that I'll show you some pretty wild stuff is we're going to use one oscillator to f do phase modulation on another oscillator. So I've set these two up here. So we have HOSC, which is horizontal oscillator, and VOSC, which is vertical oscillator. And then we're going to have another little thing here that we use as sort of like we're going to mix things together somehow. If you want to mix things, we'll have this little placeholder thing of OSC out, and you can just plug in whatever you want there. So say we wanted to add these two together, we would do V OSC plus H OSC. And you probably want to do something like um, fract here. Or some other way to sort of kind of uh, deal with the fact that if you're adding two oscillators together, you're definitely going to have values above one. Uh, so just something to think about is what to do with values that go above one or below zero. If you're subtracting them, you'll have negative values. You want to sort of double check and see what happens when you just spit them out as is, but also do some tests and do some sort of like uh, uh, overflow uh, distortions in order to make them more interesting. Uh, but let me show you what f I mean by phase modulation. So phase is a remarkably inconsistently used term in uh, uh, <clears throat> signal processing. Uh, 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 one of the ways that we use phase is just to describe the argument of some kind of an oscillator. Uh, 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 so if we're doing phase modulation, in that context, that means that we're modulating the phase, the argument, the, the, the value that sort of keeps going up and down all the time uh, of an oscillator with another oscillator. So let's be careful here and think about what we're doing. We want to have the frequency component. Remember, that's the stuff that changes over the space of one single frame. That's the amount of sort of change in modulation, change in amplitude of our video oscillator that happens within one single frame. So we want that to be affecting the frequency. So we could do something like this, add H oscillator right in there. But if you think about what does that mean if we trace that through the path into here, uh, if we just have frequency be two things that are added together, one of them is dependent on the, the, the vertical component and the other one is just sort of independent of that, we're actually just going to be kind of doing a little like offset. We're going to offset the axis that we're working with, but we're not really going to offset the frequency of anything. So frequency will always need to be dependent on the, the some sort of like geometric uh, uh, multiplier here. So we want to make sure if we're going to put the H oscillator value in here, we have to make sure that we're adding it inside of these parentheses so that it gets multiplied by color Y and then scales uh, 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 with the 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 um, scales with the the <laughs> frequency already. So I will add like a multiplier here too. So 10.0 times h h osc. Uh, we'd probably want to add uh, 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 for ideally we'd want to have another control right there. That so that we can use some sort of manual control to turn up and down how much frequency mod or phase modulation we have at any point. Uh, but yeah, so we're adding that in there. And of course, if we wanted to do frequency modulation, we would want to multiply by that whole thing. And I'll show you, well, I'll, yeah, I'll explain that when I talk about the homework. So now I'm modulating oscillator, uh, uh, the, the horizontal oscillator. So if I turn horizontal oscillator amplitude all the way to zero, then we just have our vertical oscillator. And let me just set that to, mo to, 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 to have the rate be moving a little bit. We turn amplitude back up, and then we can see kind of what's going on when I turn up frequency of the phase modulator. We're sort of repeating this like 
Um, I don't know, like an opera house pattern, like a band shell pattern that's happening here. And now let me change the frequency of and change the rate of the, the, the vertical oscillator. And now we're getting a more complex pattern. So that's basically the bare minimum of things you need to know, understand about how to modulate oscillators together. And that's going to be figuring out different ways to geometrically align things and figuring out different ways to use oscillators to modulate other oscillators is the fundamental part of this homework. Because, of course, we don't really just want to be limited to like a saw wave or a sine wave or a square wave or whatever. We want to have complex uh, wave shapes that move uh, along sort of like any arbitrary axis. So... Let's just talk about the homework real quick, and I'll show you a couple of cheats, uh, a couple of hints on how to do things, and that'll be the end of this class. All right, so first bit of homework is, so we've got phase modulation. If you wanted to do frequency modulation, try something out where you multiply this whole thing by h os, by h -os instead of adding it inside of the inside here. Multiply color y times all this stuff times h osc and then see what happens there And the main point of having you do that is to sort of show you it doesn't really work out quite as well as you'd hope it would um, Something else we're gonna ask you to do amplitude modulation So that's a way to figure out how to use the amplitude of h osc here to modulate the this argument in here um what else? I'm going to ask you to figure out how to do some different wave shapes. So the way I would do that is set up some if statements or switch statements in here. So just if wave shape equals something, you can probably figure out what if wave shape is. And we'll set up a couple of different cases here for different waves that we'll have. Um, if you want, probably the, the, the first one to try is try sine. And we've got a sine function in a, a, a GLSL. <laughs> Actually, while I'm doing that, let me make sure that it's spelled that way. <laughs> yep, so it's spelled like that. Every so often it's spelled with the E. Uh, 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 if you just look up any function and then write GLSL after it, it'll take you to khronos.org, the OpenGL reference page. You can find all of the OpenGL uh, uh, functions in there and how to use them. Uh, come in very handy. Um, and then I'll put one more hint in here. If we want to have a square wave, think about how to use logic or how to use a sine wave that is negative half the time and positive the other half to uh, 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 along with logic to make a square wave. Okay, so that's those are some hints right there. One more hint, I'm not gonna write it down, but you can take the saw wave and turn it into a triangle wave using some similar things. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 the main part of the, the, the first part of the homework is figuring out different wave shapes and experimenting with different either built-in functions in GLSL uh, uh, and different sorts of like code things you can do like you know maybe you take two sine waves and multiply them together uh, so in some way do some sort of like wave shaping kind of things um, I'm gonna ask you to think about you definitely want to get a square wave happening and then think about pulse width modulation um, I'm gonna ask you to think about wave folding how to how to add a wave folder in um, I'm gonna ask you to figure out some ways to sort of arbitrarily switch between horizontal and vertical alignment of things 
So we just have this basic thing. We've got color X and color Y. These are just the, 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 the representing one axis, both axis. But say I wanted to have like an oscillator that goes diagonal. How would we do diagonal oscillators? Uh, say I have an oscillator and I want it to start in the middle of the screen and just sort of radiate out like ripples. How would we do that? Um, so that's pretty much it. Thinking about some more complicated ways we can uh, uh, modulate the geometry of these oscillator systems. Uh, so yeah, that should be the bare minimum of what you need. Remember, make sure that you can do at least one quarter of the homework. You've got at least one quarter of the homework finished before trying the next video. Uh, 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 and also remember, you're not going to finish all of the homework in like a, a week or so. This is homework is a large meal for you to sit and chew on and work on for months at a time. And uh, uh, if you ever finish the, the, the part of the goal of is, is once you've sort of gotten and finished the homework is that you've probably given yourself another large set of questions that you want to answer. And in the process of doing the homework, you've also discovered a lot of things that you probably wouldn't have picked up on your own if you were just casually experimenting. All right. So that's the end of class number two, and I hope everyone gets excited for the next time because then we're going to talk about, we're going to set oscillators aside for a little bit and then talk about doing video feedback. All right.